In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new episode of the Fact Series in which we discuss international political matters every week. This is Fuad Mahdavi, and in this episode, I will be the host of Ivan Ridley, a British journalist, commentator, and a vocal supporter of Palestine. We are here to discuss anti-Islamic citizenship rule of India. Thank you for joining us, Ivan, and good to be with you. For the first question, I would like to ask you to start with the current Indian ruling party adopting a law in parliament on non-Indian inhabitants. Go ahead. Well, this was quite a shocking piece of legislation and one which has been roundly condemned by most of the world. Uh, the legislation seeks to persecute uh, certain minorities within India and that includes uh, the main focus of this legislation is the Muslim community, although uh, Jews are also discriminated against by this uh, piece of legislation, which is fueled, um, I can only say, by Islamophobia and out-and-out -out racism. And when you consider the very foundations of India and and the uh, its founding father Gandhi. This is all the more shocking. Um, I would imagine that uh, he would be repulsed by such a move, and and it it really is um, a loathsome piece of legislation, and it shows that the leader of India, Narendra Modi is pandering to the extreme fringes within his own party. And I'm talking about um, Hindu fundamentalists and extremists because this legislation has also been condemned by mainstream Hindu uh, people as well. It, it really is uh, absolutely mm -hmm. shocking. Despite uh, these fierce conflict, why this critical issue is associated with the censorship or silence of different nations? How do you think? Unfortunately, the international community is becoming more and more uh, selfish, I would say, or more disinterested. And I think that this goes to the heart of uh, the United States and the uh, Donald Trump mantra of make America great again. Um, he has turned his entire nation into one that is of self-interest. And if it's not of any interest uh, to America, uh, they just discard it. And this sort of uh, attitude seems to be picked up or having an impact with the rest of the international community. And unfortunately, instead of being a world leader and, and uh, a shining example of uh, democracy, the USA has become very self-centered. It's America first, foremost center. You know, it's, it's all about America. And this legislation will not impact at all on the majority of those who vote for Donald Trump. And unfortunately, uh, they have, you know, they're, they're not interested. And this has had a domino effect throughout the rest of the international community. You look at the situation of the Syrian refugees and hardly anyone in the international community is prepared to help um, unless it means uh, refugees coming into Europe and then suddenly they get very agitated. You look at the plight of the Rohingya refugees. Uh, untold war crimes have been placed against them and yet not one person has been held into account and here we have nearly one million refugees now sitting in squalid camps in Bangladesh and unable to move with their lives or progress or improve their lives. They are terrified to go back uh, to Burma um, or Myanmar, as it's called these days. 
and yet the international community has not re been robust enough to follow through on the United Nations statements that war crimes have been committed and that this has been a genocide. So if the international community is hardly prepared to move uh, for the plight of the Rohingya, it gives a green light to countries like India, where Narendra Modi seems to be able to come out with the most foul legislation and get it passed through uh, the Indian parliament. It really is mm -hmm. quite Right. Shocking. You mentioned something uh, interesting about the trace of uh, the US in this case. How do you think about the role of England's policy in this case? As you know, in 1947, if I'm not mistaken, England with, uh, withdrew from India and Pakistan was separated from India. Since, the, since then, uh, on the basis of some claims and interpretations, England has sowed the seeds of division there. Do you believe in it? Or uh, if you believe in it, do you think that this is a continuation of that, continuation of that story or not? This is a prime example of what happens under colonial occupation. And the British Empire did leave its mark on India. It also left its mark on uh, Pakistan. And there is this running sore that we know as Kashmir. And that is the legacy of the uh, British colonialism. And unfortunately, when uh, Britain retreated from India, it did sow the seeds of division indeed. And now we have this situation where we have two nuclear powers, India and Pakistan. They've gone to war three times already over Kashmir, which, as I say, is a legacy, an unresolved legacy that was left behind by the British Empire and the British colonial occupation. And uh, unfortunately, wherever uh, Britain seems to have stretched its empire, it has sown the seeds of division on departure or mm -hmm. during occupation. Great, so you confirm this? Yes, I mean, that that is what I would You know, uh, I, this say. is very important um, that you confirm as a British. Uh, Yes, I, you know, I'm not, not alone in the evils of colonialism and uh, I'm not um, in a minority voice. You know, there's a great deal of shame uh, that is felt by British people when um, the legacy of the empire comes back to haunt. Mm -hmm. uh, great, thank you very much. Let us know about Trump's travel to India to have a meeting with the Indian Prime Minister. How could you see this? Okay, uh, I'd like to know about the Trump's travel to the India to have a meeting with the Indian Prime Minister. I'd like to have your perspective about uh, this uh, movement. The the movement. Trump's travel to um, India. Yeah, Trump. To India. Oh, Trump. Well, you know. Um, Donald Trump has aligned himself with some very strange leaders uh, and um, has emerged, you know, full of praise for them. Um, we look at his uh, meeting with Kim Jong-un. Um, that didn't resolve a single thing, and, and yet there was lots of um, fanfare about that meeting. He's... Uh, he, he has aligned himself with some very uh, brutal characters. Um, he won't have a word to say against the Saudi regime, and yet this is a regime um, which did away with a journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, in the most brutal fashion. And, uh, and now, of course, he has gone to India and uh, Narendra Modi um, has appealed to the outsized ego of the American president by holding this huge rally 
in uh, in a, a stadium in India, and uh, he was given a rapturous um, applause and and cheers all round by the um, the Indian people who had been assembled there, and it of course appeals to the U.S. president, who is a man with a very very thin skin um, and a huge ego. So he doesn't take criticism lightly, uh, but he basks in praise. And so when Narendra Modi rolled out the red carpet for him, um, it, it was uh, quite unbelievable uh, reaction uh, for a man who also has um, equally racist, obnoxious policies um, as uh, as Modi. And it will be interesting to see what trade transpires between the two, because uh, there were no, mm -hmm. but very little. Exactly. Trade. Thank you. For the next question, I'd like to ask you whether or not you find any trace of the uh, Zionist regime in this case. Well, uh, Modi has shown that he is prepared to do business uh, with anyone who um, is up for offering lucrative deals to India. And of course, um, Israel is there in the queue. Uh, I believe that there was uh, quite a controversial submarine deal that went on between the two. And, of course, these are both nuclear powers. And it's quite clear that, um, you know, there are these regimes around that um, are willing uh, to do deal if there's big money involved. And we see this from Washington, we see it in New Delhi, we see it in Tel Aviv, uh, we see it in Riyadh. Um, wherever there is big business, uh, there is a lack of, uh, of morals. And could you find rights. any uh, solution to this problem yourself? Uh, yes, and that would be to scrap the United Nations or press a reload button for the United Nations and start all over again and have all countries fully on board when it comes to international human rights, when it comes to international justice. Unless we are all playing on a, a level playing field, with high standards, then unfortunately uh, you will see this abuse of power. And it is an abuse of power where the mantra really is might is right, where the stronger will go stronger. I mean, the whole point of the United Nations, you know, it came together after the Second World War and all these human rights and, and were put in place. And it, it, uh, it, the UN should have been the policeman to see that everyone upheld these laws and joined in and embraced these laws. But uh, unfortunately, at the moment, in my view, the United Nations is not fit for purpose. And instead of countries all coming on board um, to human rights, you get uh, countries cherry picking. For instance, um, Israel refuses to recognize the international criminal courts. The United States will only recognize certain aspects of international law. Uh, a lot of countries routinely ignore the Geneva Conventions and the Vienna Conventions. And so if we're not all going to collectively uh, agree 
on the same principles, uh, then it, it shows uh, the weakness of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Very great. Thank you. At the end, if you think something is, mi something is missing, please uh, let me know. I'm all ears. I just think that we're living in very dangerous times, uh, very strange times. You know, at the moment, the world has a common enemy in the coronavirus. And you look at the way different countries have been affected. And uh, this should be a time when we should all be coming together to help everyone, to help each other. And, and uh, unfortunately, the the world is a very fragmented place at the moment. And perhaps, you know, we might all learn a lesson from the coronavirus because it doesn't discriminate. It has no respect for the poor or the rich, the powerful um, or the weak. It is just out there and it is going right through our communities. And the only way that we can combat some, something like this is if we all pull together as one. And, uh, you know, these are, are, are really critical times where we need to look back to the, the mood um, after the Second World War and the vision that uh, brought together the United Nations. And we need to start and... and uh, Go back yeah, to it seems uh, we again. Uh, again we encounter uh, another plot on behalf of the US and uh, uh, actually Zionist regime. Well, it's it's not just uh, the US and uh, Israel. It is uh, you know it's a lot of um, influential countries that um, are abusing their power and abusing their influence. And, you know, it, it's certainly not promoting peace. As I say, we're in very troubled times. Uh, we have traditional allies that are squaring up to each other as enemies. Um, we have heroes who've become villains and, and uh, you know, the world is in a mess, and uh, maybe it's going to take something like the coronavirus for all these world leaders to realize that we need each other, we need to support each other, and instead of trying to undermine and uh, destroy nations, we should be um, cooperating and helping each other and uh, building nations mm -hmm. of uh, dismantling Great. Them. Thank you very much. Uh, good words and noteworthy uh, words on behalf of you about uh, the status of India and, of course, about the coronavirus. If you agree, we can uh, keep the path up in another time uh, to discuss coronavirus and the influence over this uh, matter. Thanks for joining us again, and I wish you full of health. Thank you. Dear audience, thanks for watching this episode that was a talk with Yvonne Ridley, a British journalist and political activist. Catch you later.